highlight, I'd like to highlight just a couple of announcements for the week. Uh, one, parents, the parent partnership is coming up on February 1st. That'll be Saturday morning from 9 to 11.30. Um, Amy and I had the chance to participate in one of those recently and found those really helpful and profitable. Um, part of it is because you hear good um, thoughts from other parents and lessons they've learned, but also because you have a chance to share with others and meet some other parents and have some discussions about it as well. The topic this time will be deliberate discipleship, cultivating habits of grace in the home. Uh, Justin Cole will be sharing some about patterns of Bible reading, uh, Jeremy Kimball about patterns of prayer, and John Davis about patterns of fellowship. They will have breakfast and child care provided. In fact, they encourage you to allow your kids to come in their pajamas for a pajama party while you're having your meetings. So um, look to sign up for that at gracecedarville.org. Uh, this is our second week of SEEK. That's an annual 40-day season for us as a church to really seek the Lord in prayer and in fasting. We have various meetings through the week as well. <clears throat> Elders will be leading prayer times uh, during the noon hours. There's uh, small groups going on. Just check out either your app or the website or the bulletin or the newsletter for more information. And this year, as we focus on the Lord's Prayer, we're trying to together uh, join in our hearts to really hear what the disciples' longings and cries should be and what that should sound like in our prayers together. Um, part of that this year is we have a prayer wall out back. Um, you have sticky notes in the hymnal racks in front of you. Feel free to write a prayer request and post it out there. You can do that anonymously or leave your name. And then we encourage you to go by and read those and pray for them. If you do that, even put a little tally mark on the bottom so when that person sees it, they know they've been prayed for. I've seen some people go by with their phones and just snap some pictures of a section, take it with them for the week. Um, it's just one other means for us to try to work to pray together as we seek the Lord's face intentionally during this time. Let's pray. Humbly, thankfully, we come before you, our Father. We're amazed that you not only allow us, but actually invite us into your presence. We're thrilled that we are no longer excluded, but that through your Son, Jesus, we have now been brought near, transferred into your kingdom, and actually adopted into your royal family. <clears throat> we know that this is undeserved. <clears throat> Even this week, while we honor the life and the impact of Martin Luther King, Jr., we're reminded of our brokenness, knowing that the unleashed sinfulness of our hearts has left a trail of hurt and division, a legacy of selfishness, using and actually abusing others to protect our own false pride and for personal advancement. We beg your forgiveness, and we turn to you as the only hope of change in our hearts and in our world. Please, through the power of your spirit, cultivate in us the hearts that Jesus described of his followers in Matthew 5. Let the values of your kingdom shine through us as you make us people who are always aware of our desperate need for you rather than trusting in our own goodness or our own accomplishments, who mourn over the honest brokenness in ourselves and in society, who in meekness demonstrate strength of self-control to bless rather than take advantage of others, who have a hunger for what is truly right and good rather than our own personal and immediate pleasure, who offer mercy rather than judgment, who pursue, pursue you not as a hobby or for personal gain, but with a singular focus to honor your name, and who choose the hard work <clears throat> of reconciling enemies rather than self-protection, self-advancement, or harboring malice in our hearts that push division rather than uniting people. Make us strong enough in character and in commitment to stand firm in these ways, even if it means suffering for the cause for the name of Jesus. Father, in us and through us, please make your name known and hallowed in our community, in our country, and in the entire world. We long for Jesus' return when all is made right and your presence and power rule the day. But until then, let your priorities, your values, and your heart rule us. We ask in these six weeks of seeking your face together that you and your work will come more clearly into focus and that we will see more glimpses of these future promises in us today, influencing those around us towards Jesus, our King, in whose name we pray. Amen. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. 
Well, we are in week two of Seek. I hope you have your book. I hope you'll be taking notes. I hope you'll be following along in this week's guide as well, guiding your prayer, perhaps guiding your family time. Want to make sure you have one of these. We still have a few of them left, so you pick one up out uh, in Connection Central if uh, you'd like one. Also, I just want to add my little prompt that you also pick up one of those little sticky notes. Um, They uh, are in each of the pews, and we want to pray for you. You know, as I went through the wall, um, and full uh, disclosure, I went through it on a day before we had decided to do the ticks, so I... I I want you to know you were prayed for, even if you don't see a tick on your card or on your sticky note. It is amazing to see all the things that are in the hearts of our people, um, from young to old. And it is just such a privilege to be praying together like this. So I hope you are doing that. You can open your copy of Scripture to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be there and a few other places as well today. We are in the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer falls right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is famous far beyond the church's walls. There have been numerous thinkers and writers who have borrowed its content and its ideas. You may have heard some of the following, not in church, but in movies, and you may have read it someplace. You may have heard people speaking and say such things like going the extra mile, turning the other cheek, people being the salt of the earth, loving your enemies, judge not, pearls before swine, the golden rule, the straight and narrow, wolves in sheep's clothing. Every one of those is an expression that comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, the Beatitudes begin the Sermon on the Mount, and many people reflect on those, especially the blessed are the meek or the peacemakers. And of course, the Lord's Prayer right in the middle of the sermon, is quite well known. The only problem is most people treat this sermon, treat these phrases, treat these portions as if they are simply pithy sayings, uh, proverbs, prescriptions for everyone. The whole world would benefit, we're told, if, if we'd only follow these truths. The fact is the whole world can't, and Jesus never even expected it to, at least not until his second coming. He wasn't offering a prescription for the world, but a description of God's kingdom and those of us who live in it. In the Beatitudes, Jesus describes his kingdom citizens in terms that are not usually associated with successful living, poor in spirit, mourning, those who are meek, those who are persecuted, That's not successful living in the eyes of the world, but it is in the eyes of Christ, for these things mark the lives of those who are blessed by God. And the fact that it, it applies to today has to do with the whole idea of being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. That's not going to happen when Jesus comes. He lays out the kingdom's constitution following the Beatitudes, the ways that we we follow our king, and it's in stark contrast to the understandings of the religious leaders of his day, pointing toward a change of heart rather than just a change of behavior. And that change of heart would lead to a change of destiny. And he describes the kingdom's culture as cultivating that heart change over conforming to human expectation. We want to cultivate and build those kingdom values on the inside and see them come out. Now, as we return to the Lord's Prayer and its glimpse, as we said last week, of the ideal heart of the righteous, the ideal heart of the kingdom citizen, and what a kingdom citizen really should want to pray, we come to the second petition Jesus gives us, your kingdom come. Three simple words. And yet, they're an amazing call to turn the world upside down or right side up, both in the future and today. You gotten all comfortable sitting there? Good. Please stand. We're going to recite the Lord's Prayer together once again. We want this stuck in our heads and in our hearts. Let's pray it together, shall we? 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, that is our prayer. Help us now as we study this prayer that your son gave us so we can learn how we might pray in ways that maximize what you have for us. Amen. You can be seated. As we consider this petition, your kingdom come, I want to show you a number of things. First of all, I want to show you the reign that it seeks. What is it that we're praying for when we pray your kingdom come? Well, your kingdom is the kingdom of the Father as mediated through Jesus. So we've read the prayer. Now let's look at this reign that it seeks, the rule of King Jesus in the world and in our lives. Jesus spoke of the kingdom being at hand. So he, he says the kingdom is, is, is not just coming, it's, it's at hand, it's near, it's close. He says it in Matthew 3 and he says it again in Matthew 4. But he also speaks of a future coming in his kingdom glory. And I think we'd all agree that even though Jesus came to earth, even though the gospel is here, This is not what we would expect the the rule of Jesus to look like in its fullness, is it? This world still is in rebellion to him, and so there must be some future coming of his kingdom glory. Now, that future coming would overcome all other kingdoms and authorities. For example, if you go back to the book of Daniel, an amazing book of prophecy from an exile of Israel, Daniel, a young man, is taken into the palace, becomes a wise man for the king, and is given by God the ability to interpret a dream the king had had. And that dream foretold kingdoms, starting with that particular king and coming all the way down to a fourth empire that most Bible scholars identify with Rome. And those those kingdoms all seem to get stronger and stronger and stronger until... An end comes, and and at the very end, when it seems like all might be lost in terms of evil triumphing through these kingdoms, we read in Daniel chapter 2 of a stone cut out of a mountain, this large stone coming and crushing this statue that, that, that reflects these four kingdoms and destroying them and then growing into a mountain. And, and when you read Daniel 2, it doesn't take too long to discover that this is talking about the kingdom that God has. In fact, in Daniel 2, when I want to open to it, you might want to look at Daniel 2 as well. I don't know. But if you do, you'll find in the interpretation that Daniel gives, he talks about this kingdom. He says in verse 45 of Daniel 2, just as you saw a stone cut from the mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Those are the other kingdoms. A great God has made known to you what shall be after this. These things will be destroyed. Verse 44, what kind of kingdom is this? And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. So basically he says the stone destroys all those other kingdoms, sets up a kingdom, and there'll be no other kingdom after that. Now, If you're wondering about that kingdom, there's more in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7 about that. We learn that this future coming of this kingdom is going to overcome all kingdoms, all authorities. And in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, we hear echoed at the end of the New Testament... That very theme, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, these current kingdoms of this world are under the power of the evil one. And, and, and we're going to see that in just a minute. But as we go to not just Daniel 2, but Daniel 7, we learn something else about this future destruction of these earthly rulers. These kings, these earthly rulers, these kingdoms, and just if you're interested, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, 
Rome, represent world powers that, that dominated over the peoples from Daniel's time all the way to the time of Jesus. There seems to be a future kingdom as well that's talked about, and that's a really debated one, and we're gonna have to, we don't have time to get into that, but, but we will talk about that. There is this idea that this idea of kingdom continues, and we're told in the New Testament that earthly rulers function under the power and sometimes the direct control of spiritual forces in the heavenly places, demons. There are, there are evil forces at work. They were working Daniel's day. We're told there was a prince of Persia who was controlling the king of Persia. That prince of Persia, though, was in the heavenlies fighting against, fighting against God's angel himself. So we realize that, that things are bad here and that things aren't just bad. It's not just that there are earthly kingdoms, but there are evil forces behind these earthly kingdoms, and they continue to resist God and fight God and fight God until Daniel 7 tells us a judgment comes, and a judgment comes on these realms, on these kingdoms, and, and they, they continue in their rebellion. They continue right up to the very end to get worse and worse in hating God. But we're told that God breaks in. And we're told in verse 26, the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away. That's the last, the final of the kings who's rebuking God to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the king of his dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. We're told in Daniel 7 that, that thrones are set up, and one like the Son of Man sits on them. So we're clearly talking about something that hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen it yet. But this prophetic picture of a rock carved out without hands, symbolizing divine work, destroying earthly kingdoms, or, or thrones being set up and the Son of Man sitting on them, they echo Revelation 5 where there is God sitting on his throne and he's holding a sealed scroll that represents the deed of, of the universe, the deed of heaven and earth. And, and the cry goes out, who is worthy to open? Who can take this and begin to execute what is written here? And then we're told one steps forward, a, a lamb, a bloodied lamb, a wounded lamb, who's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, will take that scroll and take control. So we're talking about something coming in the future. So when we pray, your kingdom come, we're praying, Lord, would you bring this divine catastrophe on the evil forces of this world? Will you break its power? And would you do that now? Your kingdom come. We should long for this. We should long for this, and in praying this prayer, we should understand that without the coming of Jesus to interrupt the world's trajectory, we and the world itself have no hope. Now, this week, I read somebody who says, not so fast. Actually, things are just getting better and better and better. Listen to this. It's a report that was in The Spectator, a magazine published in, in England on December 21st, 2019. He says, let nobody tell you that the second decade of the 21st century, that's the one that just finished, has been a bad time. We're living through the greatest improvement in human living standards in history. Extreme poverty has fallen below 10% of the world's population for the first time. It was 60% when I was born. This man was born in the 1950s. Global inequality has been plunging as Africa and Asia experience faster economic growth than Europe and North America. Child mortality has fallen to record low levels. Famine virtually went extinct. Malaria, polio, heart disease are all in decline. Things are just getting better and better. And you know what? We can't, we can't help but acknowledge God making man in his image has given us creative abilities that have allowed us to make improvements. That's absolutely true. But you know, my favorite line from one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride, is, get used to disappointment. The thing is, just when we think things are going to work out, they don't. And with all those improvements, with all those things being made better and better and better and better, the problem is that evil continues to advance 
at the same pace, probably faster than humanity's progress. We invent a new technology, evil people find out a way to hurt people with it. Yes, conditions may, may improve, but it seems the more conditions improve, the more we figure out how to use these things to our own ends rather than to glorify God. So don't let someone tell you because things are getting better and better that somehow perhaps we're going to usher in a golden era. No, 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 no. Frankly, if the Lord Jesus does not come and put a stop to these evil kingdoms and the evil influences that rule and take things and turn them evil, we will, we will be lost. We have no hope to make things better, but our king will. Now, everything I've just talked to you about, I grew up hearing about it all the time. I grew up in a church and in, in a whole movement of churches, and I think this church was part of it, that, that used to spend a lot of time talking about our future, perhaps too much time. We had prophecy constantly. We talked about prophecy all the time, what was coming, and we really stressed our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But, you know, we so dug into that, and we, t- we concentrated on it and concentrated on it that we almost became a caricature of Bible study because a Bible study never seemed to attract people unless it had some prophetic detail in it. Then people wanted to come and hear it. So what happened? That generation grew up and kind of reacted against that and said, you know, there's a whole lot about the kingdom that's here and now, and there's a whole lot of teaching that has to do with how we live now, and we kind of set that aside. And I would suggest to you that we have experienced an amazing pendulum swing to the point where many, even in full-time ministry, have absolutely never thought about, seriously, what does the, the prophetic word say? What, what about our hope? What, what is going to happen? I talk with students in seminaries. I I interviewed candidates for jobs here who, when we talked about eschatology, they said, well, you know, that was the last thing in the schedule of systematic theology, and we always ran out of time, so we we had a day to talk about it. I'm not not announcing that we're going to start having prophecy conferences with charts surrounding the building, as I can recall from days long past. But I am saying that we do need to rekindle a healthy awareness of both our future hope and the severe judgments that will precede its arrival. Why? Because if we love people, we want them to flee from the wrath that is coming. And we need to realize that short of the Lord's return, the advance of evil and deception will continue to amaze and horrify us. The kingdom, then, when we pray your kingdom come, is coming in the future, but it is also coming more and more each day. And that comes to my second point, the realities that this petition acknowledges. This petition, this prayer, actually acknowledges that that the kingdom of God is not yet fully realized here on earth, even though it is in heaven. Because remember that petition at the end of the first three? On earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, God's rule is uncontested and everything is perfect, but not here. The Beatitudes present us with a present life calling. Blessed are the, those who mourn, the, the, the meek, the, the peacemaker. That's present. That's, that's living here and now. But then what does it say? They shall be future. Isn't it interesting that even in the Beatitudes we have a present aspect of the kingdom and a a future hope that's going to be fulfilled? Jesus is king and his followers are kingdom citizens in which he by his spirit lives. But until that future coming, Jesus says to us, Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is in your midst. It is here. How is it here? It's among us because the king in that day was present, and even today he rules in our hearts and within his community, which means we who have believed the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the king, are supposed to represent that kingdom now. Now, the church is not God's kingdom, but the church is three things. First, we are the product of the kingdom. Why? Because we believe the kingdom's gospel. The kingdom's gospel is that Jesus is king, and the king has made a way to bring subjects into the kingdom through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection. His work has caused us to be adopted as sons and daughters into the kingdom. And that makes us the product of the kingdom. 
It makes us the community of the kingdom. We are each of us citizens of heaven. Remember, our citizenship is not on earth, but in heaven, Paul says. We are citizens of that kingdom. And and as citizens of that kingdom, we are to live as people in that kingdom. We don't have a whole lot of diversity of cultures around Cedarville, Ohio, but coming from L.A. County as I did, it, we, we would visit all sorts of places where in the middle of, of L.A. There are, there's Chinatown and there's Koreatown and there's little Tokyo. And by the way, those are only the major ones. There are little enclaves of almost every major ethnic group that's, that are represented there. And if you really want good ethnic food, that's where you go. And, and you go into these sections and you feel like you're, you're living in the middle of a place that represents another country in your country. And, and that's fine. That's what we are as Christians. We are citizens of a kingdom. And we are a demonstration of the kingdom. We're to be present representatives of what this kingdom and our hope should bring about. As citizens of the kingdom... As as part of his community, we are kingdom ambassadors. We let others know about this kingdom. We are those who tell others who are not yet in the kingdom, we have an open borders policy. Come in. This is all you have to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and receive him as your king, and you will be welcome into into his kingdom and into our community. It's interesting we're talking about this on the weekend of the King holiday. There is perhaps no greater example in modern history of of someone who grasped hold of future kingdom promises and sought to make them affect the way the people of his audience. And remember, back when he gave his I Have a Dream speech in 1963, almost everybody he was speaking to and almost everybody in America claimed to be Christians. So speaking to people who claimed to be Christians, he said this. Listen to these words. He says, I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood kind of like Jews and Gentiles in in Ephesians 2. I have a dream that one day, even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Those are two words we're not familiar with anymore, but we probably need to remember what they symbolized. That one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Listen to this. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low and the rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. He was calling a nation full of people who called themselves Christians to long for that day that we pray for your kingdom come, that it would come, but to recognize we have the ability now to change things and to pray for things and to work for things that would be different. He said that in 1963. Pursuing that kind of reconciled living, though, beginning with the church, is one way we live out kingdom realities today. So you see, this prayer is not just a prayer for that future catastrophe. This prayer is for present courage and faith among us as those who have already been changed and become kingdom citizens. Third, let me talk a little bit about the rules that this kingdom provides. We don't have to look very far to understand. You know, when we pray for your kingdom come, what's the kingdom going to look like? We don't have to dream and conjure and guess. Because Jesus' entire teaching ministry was in some way a glimpse of the kingdom, an understanding of its promises. 
a warning of its judgments. So what did Jesus say about the kingdom? He said, we won't experience it unless we are radically redirected. He used the word repentance. It's our highest priority to have the kingdom because having it means we have everything else. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We're not just supposed to experience it ourselves, but we are to call people to receive it. He sent out his disciples to proclaim the kingdom, and he sends us out with our great commission. And the kingdom's life comes through the gospel. Think of the parables where he said the seed is the word, the gospel taking root. Here are just a few specifics that I, I, I could suggest that we, we are praying or should be praying when we pray, your kingdom come. What would that mean? Well, again, I take this from Matthew, that our presence would slow and even stop the progress of sin's destruction. Salt of the earth that our behavior would highlight the good of God's law rather than point to ways to avoid it. Jesus says, don't ever teach people not to follow God's law. That revenge would give way to reconciliation. That our marriages and sexual behaviors would be marked by radical purity rather than relational destruction. That people could trust every word we say without question. Your yes, yes, and your no, no. That enemies of the gospel would be confounded by our love for them. That our holiness would focus on how God sees us, not on what others think of us. That our trust in our Father would let us relax in His care. No anxiety. That we'd never treat others any worse than we would expect them to treat us. I think you know the golden rule. That our lives would consistently trust God's word over any other so-called wisdom. Build lives on the rock. Those are the realities that when we pray your kingdom come ought to be shaping us. But finally, I do need to talk about the resistance that we mount. You know, we, we want the kingdom, right? Well, yeah, maybe. Do you understand that in our own hearts, even as believers, there are times when we are not as ready to seek the kingdom as our king would want us to be. We want the kingdom to come in some ways and sometimes, but we aren't always sure we want it right now. We want the kingdom to come once we have received the here and now that we desire. You know, back in the day when we believed that Jesus was coming at any moment, which of course the Bible says he could, but we don't think about that that much. When that was much more present to us, I still remember guys in college saying to me things like, man, I can't wait for the Lord to come, but I sure hope it's after I get married. And I remember young couples saying, I sure hope it's after we have children. Why? Because we believe that those gifts were better than Jesus. 
If you can think of anything, you're saying, oh, I want the Lord to come, but, but, but I, I just hope he'll, he'll let this happen first. I'll follow you, but let me bury my father first. When you pray your kingdom come, do you mean it? Do you mean I don't care if he interferes with all the plans and all that I have? Lord, I'm in the middle of building this beautiful house. You can almost hear your soul saying, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. We like kingdom principles. Except when they interfere with our success, our plans, our happiness, or our getting back at that person who really shafted us. We love kingdom principles. We want the kingdom to come except when I have to turn the other cheek to that obnoxious person. When I have to tell the truth that helps my adversary. Or when I have to cut myself off from the ways I would normally indulge my pet sin. Oh, there's so much more than three words when we pray, your kingdom come. We must ask ourselves if we are truly praying this or praying it with our fingers crossed. What might praying this petition signify for all of us? Well, we know the world is broken through its rebellion through its just ongoing evil. And this world can never be broken of that evil and freed from that evil until the king comes. So we pray, your kingdom come, Lord Jesus. We want you to break in. We want you to change everything the way you say you will. But until then, your kingdom come, we want you to use us as your instruments to extend the influence of your kingdom among ourselves and into the world. We want people to see there's a different way to live. We want them to see that, that the kingdoms of this world offer nothing compared to the kingdom you promise. What will your kingdom come thinking do to my praying? Well, first it should bring hope. Anything bad that I need to pray about, and I need to pray for a lot, about a lot of bad things, will have an ultimately good ending. Peter calls all these bad things momentary light afflictions not worth comparing to the eternal weight of glory we'll receive. Anything good I have to pray about will only be better. And any brokenness that brings pain and loss is never permanent. So my praying can have hope. This kind of thinking should encourage endurance. The Lord will return. He will. He promises it. But I'm called to, put, to wait well. And so while I'm waiting, the scriptures tell me to do such things as look for the coming of the kingdom. Hasten it through prayer and obedience. Be patient until the coming of the Lord. Live in light of the coming of the Lord, realizing that everything here is temporary. That's what's permanent when he brings his reality here. That should encourage my endurance. Third, this kind of thinking should strengthen my confidence. It should strengthen my confidence. The power of the king is at work among us and through his people. The task of the kingdom proclamation and representation is guaranteed power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. You don't witness until the promise of power is fulfilled and we have power for this task. 
This kind of thinking, fourthly, should fill my praying with an increasing longing for no more. Let me tell you what I want no more of. Here's just five. Number one, no more having to call the police or the fire department or the rescue squad. Frankly, I look long for the day when those careers are obsolete. We don't need doctors and nurses. I love you now, but I long for that day when we don't need them. No more visiting the dying as their family weeps. I've gotten to do that this week. It's precious to speak comfort, but I hate seeing what it does. No more. No more walking with a brother whose wife abandons him or a sister whose husband abandons her and helping them navigate the pain, the tragedy of divorce. No more cancer. No more chemo. No more racial prejudices and grievances where Christian brothers and sisters talk over and past rather than to each other. No more divisions in the body of Christ that he died to make one. No more. I long for that day, but until that day, My praying should also be filled, finally, with a willingness to receive kingdom power now. Now. To be gospel good neighbors who witness and watch out for others. Now. To weep with those who weep. But to do so with hope to share. Power now to comfort the broken with grace. Power now to visit the sick, to pray for healing, to look for cures, and to trust God's work through medicine. Power now to seek justice and pursue it, to hear the cries of oppressed people, to prefer those whose past has been marked by mistreatment, and acknowledge when our own past was more darkness than light. This is what praying those three little words, your kingdom come, might mean to me, to us. Once more, and you can remain seated, I'd like us to read this prayer with real thought about these first, the first two lines, the introduction and the first two petitions that we've now considered together. Let's read it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, hear us as we offer these words. We don't want them to be empty from our hearts to you. We want them to be filled with meaning, acknowledging you, Father, for all that you are. Realizing we have no greater joy than to think of your name becoming the greatest and most awesome name and you the most awesome person that anyone can think of. How we long as we live in the midst of a broken world and broken relationships and broken selves still battling sin, how we long 
for your kingdom to come for that day when all of the brokenness will be healed. But Lord, we know when we pray your kingdom come, we are also acknowledging that your king, your son Jesus, is living by the Spirit in us. And as your people, we want to bring greater and greater light into a world filled with darkness, greater hope to people who are hopeless, we want to bring the promise of life through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to people who are trapped in sin and have no hope. How grateful we are for Jesus, our Savior, our King, who was our sacrifice and took the punishment our sins deserve so that we, simply by trusting Him, can have eternal life. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who needs that today, they would receive it. Father, we thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to let you be seated for just a moment, except for our elders. Any elders who are here in the service today, if you join me here on the platform, we just, just were led in singing by Taylor Robinette, and Taylor is our new part-time worship director. His role is basically to coordinate all the different teams, all the different groups that work. He'll lead occasionally as well. He'll be helping us uh, from the pastoral side also in coordinating what's going on with messages and other things, with the music. He is in charge of that. He's been a part of our church along with his wife, Ashlyn, for a while, and, and we're glad that they're here, but we're especially glad now that Taylor has taken this role. I'm going to ask the elders to come on up, and uh, let's see. We've got most of our elders are in second service, obviously. They're teaching, and many of them in classes right now, but uh, Tom already prayed one, so I'm going to ask our chairman of the board, uh, Bob Rome, to come. Taylor, you come on up here. We just want to say a special word of prayer and thanksgiving God's brought you here and uh, to commit your work with us to the Lord. So let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, this morning we are so grateful for the privilege of being able to be here amongst your people <clears throat> and grateful for the privilege of worship. And we worship you this morning. We have already and will yet this afternoon throughout the day worship you in our prayer and in music, we thank you for the privilege of having a man like Taylor, his family with us here in our church, part of who we are. And I pray for him, thank you for bringing him to us to serve in this area of ministry, to bring honor and glory to you, and to encourage us as a church family as well. And I do pray your blessing upon Taylor. I pray you would continue to use him in incredible ways. We thank you for the opportunity of being able to be here and be able to lift our voices, our hearts to you in song and in worship. Father, may your blessing be upon Taylor and his family today and the days ahead as you use him to serve us and bless you here at Grace Baptist Church. And I pray these things in the precious name of your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let me just give you a few closing instructions. Um, you still have those post-it notes. Give us a prayer request. Let us pray for you. And stop by those walls and see some of those requests and pray for them. Make a little tick mark if you can just to let people know, I prayed for that today. Um, and then Tom and, and uh, Bob won't go too far because we're going to be down here. And just want you to know that if there's any way we can encourage you, pray for you, give you any information... Uh, come see us at the end of the service. Would you stand? Let me pray for us. Send us out with the benediction. And now, Lord, that we've heard about your kingdom, we long for it. We pray your kingdom come. And yet, if it tarries, if it waits, let us be carrying kingdom power and kingdom truth and kingdom grace to those people around us who need it so desperately. We pray this in the mighty name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ.
Amen. God bless.